with Donald Trump now officially being the president-elect of the U.S., the big question becomes, what will he actually do? And while it might be impossible to map out what he'll do over the course of four full years, well, we do have a good idea of what he's likely to do starting on day number one. In fact, if we rewind the clock back to that interview 11 months ago with Sean Hannity, well, President Trump said the following. Under no circumstances, you are promising America tonight you would never abuse power as retribution against anybody. Except for day one. Yeah. Except Look, one? He's going crazy. Except for day one. Meaning? I want to close the border and I want to drill, that's drill, not a, that's, drill. That's not, oh, no. that's not retribution. I got I'm going to be, I'm going to be, you know, he keeps, <laughs> we love this guy. He says, you're not going to be a dictator, are you? I said, no, 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 other than day one. We're closing the border. And we're drilling, drilling, drilling. After that, I'm not a dictator. So that, okay. Now, what President Trump was likely referring to in that clip were day one executive orders. These are the executive orders that get prepared well, well ahead of time so that a new president can just come in, sign them into effect on the very first day of their administration. And of course, this is not anything new. In fact, on his first day in office, Joe Biden issued 17 executive orders doing things like stopping the construction of the U.S.-Mexico border wall. He revoked the permit of the Keystone XL pipeline. He rejoined the Paris Climate Accord as well as the World Health Organization. He issued a mask mandate on federal property and so on. It's fairly common for a new president to come in and hit the ground running by issuing all these different types of pre-written executive orders. Now, as of yet, the Trump transition team has not made public any official list of executive orders that might come down the pipe on the very first day. However, there are a good amount of clues that were left during the campaign trail that we can use to piece together what will likely happen on day one of a second Trump administration. And so, Let's review some of the recent statements that were made by President Trump, as well as members of his close team, in order to map out the eight executive actions that he's likely to take immediately after assuming office. To start with, Ms. Caroline Levin. She is the Trump Vance transition team's spokeswoman. She went on Fox News recently in order to discuss the Trump team's plan for their first week back in office. And during that interview, she confirmed that Trump, he still intends to issue executive orders to address the border crisis, along with another set of executive orders focused on mass deportations, on the restitution of the Remain in Mexico policy, alongside other executive orders to help facilitate domestic oil and gas production by expediting permitting for both fracking as well as drilling. Here's a short snippet from that interview over on Fox News. What I can tell you is this man is already working around the clock, looking ahead to January 2025. And we know the work ethic of President Trump that paid off in the campaign trail will bring him right back to the White House, uh, where he will get things done on day one for the well, American people. How many executive orders should we expect in week one? Uh, well, there will be tens of them, I can assure you of that. And there will be a reversal of all of the executive orders that Joe Biden and Kamala Harris signed to reverse the effective policies mm. of the first Trump administration. We know Joe Biden signed 94 executive orders on his first week on the job, all of them leading to the border crisis and the economic crisis that has been hurting the American people over the last four years. And that's why President Trump was reelected to reverse the reversal uh, of the Harris-Biden administration. Now, in regards to immigration specifically, President Trump has stated in the past on the campaign trail that he would re-implement on day one his Remain in Mexico policy. That was a policy issued during his first term in office that required asylum seekers to stay in Mexico until their cases in the U.S. were actually processed by an immigration court. This policy was put in place during Trump's first administration. It was rescinded on day one of the Biden administration by an executive order, and now it looks like it's coming back on Trump's first day in office by another executive order. Then, alongside the Remain in Mexico policy, there's also the beginnings of the mass deportations of illegal migrants throughout the entirety of the U.S. On this topic, speaking at his rally over in Madison Square Garden right before the actual election, Trump said the following. On day one, I will launch the largest deportation program in American history to get the criminals out. I will rescue every city and town that has been invaded and conquered, and we will put these vicious and bloodthirsty criminals in jail 
We're going to kick them the hell out of our country as fast as possible. And to expedite removals of Trende, Aragua, and other savage gangs like MS-13, which is equally vicious, I will invoke the Alien Enemies Act of 1798. Think of that. That's how far back. That's when they had law and order. They had some tough ones. Think of it, the Alien Enemies Act of 1798. You hear that, Mr. Speaker? Get ready. <laughs> to target and dismantle every migrant criminal network operating on American soil. And there are lots of them. And along that very same line, President Trump already assigned one of his first personnel assignments to be the new border czar, Mr. Tom Homan, who will be in charge of all of the deportation of illegal aliens back to their countries of origin. And Mr. Tom Homan, who is the former director of ICE, he seems to be a man who will be taking this particular job very seriously, evidenced by the exchange that he had with both AOC as, during a hearing, as well as another exchange that he had with a reporter over on 60 Minutes. Take a listen to both. I hear a lot of people say, you know, the talk of a mass deportation is racist, it's, it's, uh, it's threatening to the immigrant community. It's not threatening to the immigrant community. It should be threatening to the illegal immigrant community. But on the heels of historic illegal immigration crisis. Is there a way to carry out mass deportation without separating families? Of course there is. Families can be deported together. Now, depending on how you measure it, whether you just go back four years or you go back 30 years, there are literally tens of millions of illegal migrants in this country right now. And it's not the case that all of them are going to be deported on day one. That's a complicated process that's going to require planning, logistics, buses, airplanes, detention facilities, and so on. However, Trump could get the ball rolling on his first day in office by issuing an executive order invoking the Alien Enemies Act, something that he alluded to out on the campaign trail. The Alien Enemies Act was passed 226 years ago, back in the year 1798, and it allows the sitting president to deport anyone who is not an American citizen if that person is from a country with which either there is a declared war or a threatened or attempted invasion or predatory incursion. Now, you can imagine that the price tag of such an operation would be hefty. I mean, the estimates show that the American taxpayers already shell out billions of dollars per year in order to house and feed illegal migrants, but even that giant sum might pale in comparison to the cost of deporting millions or perhaps tens of millions of people. To that criticism, Trump told NBC News the following. And I said, how are you going to pay for it? He said, it's not a question of a price tag. It's not really. We have no choice. When people have killed and murdered, when drug lords have destroyed countries, and now they're going to go back to those countries because they're not staying here, there is no price tag. And so that's immigration. All right, just to pause here for a super quick moment, I'd like to introduce today's sponsor, which is a great company called Patriot Mobile. And they really are a phenomenal company because while it's safe to say that there is a concerted assault on America's values happening right now, companies like Patriot Mobile are bucking the trend and they're standing firm. I mean, as a company, in both their actions as well as their spending, they strongly support the First and Second Amendments. They strongly support the sanctity of life as well as Americans' veterans and first responders. And better still, besides just having really good values, they are actually a good company. They have great phone plans. By switching to Patriot Mobile, you'll still get the same awesome nationwide coverage as the big providers because Patriot Mobile actually operates across all three of the major networks. It's just that by switching, you'll be doing business with a company that doesn't undermine your values. Plus, they back their service with a coverage guarantee. 100% of their customer service is based right here in the US, meaning they're keeping the jobs here. You can keep your existing phone number and you can either keep your existing phone or if you'd like, you can upgrade. And so just head on over to patriotmobile.com forward slash Roman or just call 972 Patriot. Right now, they're having a special promotion where you can get a free month when you use offer code Roman. That's R O M A N. And so consider making the switch to America's only Christian conservative wireless provider. Either call the number or you can just click on the link right below this video. 
The second type of executive order might relate to undoing some of the green mandates that were imposed by the Biden administration, or as Trump succinctly called it in that earlier interview with Sean Hannity, drill, baby, drill. In other words, Trump has pledged to increase production of U.S. fossil fuels. Now, while it's not exactly clear what specifically he might do on day number one in terms of an executive order, some options, they include opening up the Arctic wilderness to oil drilling. He can roll back some of the recent environmental protections that were imposed by the Biden administration. He could halt some windmill projects. He could do away with the Biden administration's targets, which encourage car manufacturers to switch over to the production of electric vehicles. And he could also abolish some of the new environmentally friendly standards that have been imposed on American companies. And specifically to that last point, in order to achieve such a change, Trump would need a relatively strong leader to fill the role of EPA administrator. And to that end, he has chosen Lee Zeldin. He is a four-term House Republican who, in 2022, unsuccessfully ran for governor of New York. And in regards to why specifically he chose Mr. Zeldin as the new EPA administrator, here was what Trump said. Quote, Lee, with a very strong legal background, has been a true fighter for America First policies. He will ensure fair and swift deregulatory decisions that will be enacted in a way to unleash the power of American businesses, while at the same time maintaining the highest environmental standards, including the cleanest air and water on the planet. He will set new standards on environmental review and maintenance that will allow the United States to grow in a healthy and well-structured way. Likewise, shortly after getting tapped himself for the role, Lee Zeldin went on Fox News and he gave the American public a sneak peek into what he hopes to accomplish on day number one, as well as in the first 100 days. Take a listen. So day one and uh, the first 100 days, we, we have the opportunity to, to roll back regulations that are forcing businesses uh, to be able to struggle. Uh, they're, they're, they're forced to cut costs uh, internally. Uh, they are you know, moving overseas altogether. Uh, to be able to bolster liquidity in the American economy where businesses strive to grow, expand here, and have the ability to export what they produce as opposed to exporting their jobs in the company, the companies themselves. Uh, there are regulations that uh, the left wing of this country have been advocating through regulatory mm -hmm. power that ends up causing businesses to, to go in the wrong direction. And, and President Trump, when, when he called me up, uh, gosh, he, he was rattling off 15, 20 different priorities, uh, a clear focus. You know, he wasn't reading off of some sheet. It's the top of his head. And if I challenged him to give me 50 more ideas of what to do with this agency to improve the economy, I'm confident he would have done that. So advancing America first policies is one of the reasons why President Trump got elected. Uh, we have to make America great again. And often when he talks about that at the end of his rally speeches, he was also talking about uh, making our country prosperous again. Uh, and it's something that he deeply believes in. Uh, this is going to be a great four years for America. It's not just about a great day one or a great first 100 days. Uh, I have a feeling that we're on the verge of what could be the greatest four years we've ever seen of any president in the White House. Also, along that same vein, Trump might, on day one, pull America out of the Paris Climate Accords. For your reference, on his first day in office, Biden actually rejoined the Paris Accords. And so it wouldn't be surprising if on his first day, Trump pulled us back out. That, moving on from the environment, the next type of executive order might relate to tariffs. Throughout the campaign cycle, President Trump promised to impose tariffs on goods coming from several different countries, including China as well as Mexico. His argument was that such tariffs, they would keep manufacturing jobs here in the US, they would shrink the federal deficit, they would help potentially lower the price of food, and potentially help with national security. On that last point regarding national security, while he was giving a speech over in North Carolina right before the election, here's what Trump said regarding imposing tariffs on Mexico. We're being invaded by Mexico, but now we have a new president in Mexico. I suppose a very, a very nice woman, they say I haven't met her. And I'm going to inform her on day one or sooner that if they don't stop this onslaught of criminals and drugs coming into our country, I'm going to immediately impose a 25% tariff on everything they send in to the United States of America. Now, in regards to the size of the tariffs, Trump has thrown out different numbers on different occasions throughout different points of the campaign. 
including a 10% across the board tariff on all goods coming into the country, a 60% import tax on goods coming from China, as well as a 25% tariff on all goods coming from Mexico. Now, whether he's actually going to be able to do this unilaterally with just an executive order is a bit of a question mark. In theory, he would need Congress to approve these types of tariffs. However, that might not necessarily be the case because just like what happened back in the year 2018, he could theoretically go around Congress once again by citing Section 232 of the Trade Expansion Act of 1962. According to the Congressional Research Service, that particular section of the law, it gives the sitting president of America the power to adjust tariffs on imports that could affect U.S. national security, which just for your reference is exactly what Trump did back in 2018 when he imposed those steel and aluminum tariffs. Now, aside from tariffs, next is the possibility of a pardon for January 6th detainees. On multiple occasions over the past two years, President Trump has floated the idea of pardoning at least some of the prisoners connected to the events of January 6th of 2021. Here's a quick montage of President Trump on this topic speaking at various venues. If I run and if I win, we will treat those people from January 6th fairly. We will treat them fairly. And if it requires pardons, we will give them pardons because they are being treated so unfairly. Will you pardon the January 6 rioters who were convicted of federal offenses? I am inclined to pardon many of them. I can say for every single one because a couple of them probably they got out of control. My answer is, I am most likely, if I get in, I will most likely, I would say it will be a large portion of them, you know? And it'll be very early on. Well, thank you very much. And you see the spirit from the hostages, and that's what they are, as hostages. They've been treated terribly and very unfairly, and you know that, and everybody knows that. And we're going to be working on that soon. The first day we get into office, we're going to save our country and we're going to work with the people to treat those unbelievable patriots. And they were unbelievable patriots and are. You see the spirit just cheering, they're, making, they're cheering while they're doing that. And they did that in prison. And it's a disgrace, in my opinion. Now, in total, over 1,500 people have been charged in connection with the events of January 6th. And as president, Trump could pardon anyone convicted in federal court. And actually, if they haven't been convicted yet, the sitting president could just tell the attorney general to drop the case and stop the prosecution that's ongoing. And according to Trump's recent statements, that is something that he's likely going to be doing at the start of his new term. And actually, speaking of prosecutions, another very likely day one act of President Trump will be to fire Jack Smith. In fact, while being interviewed by radio host Hugh Hewitt back in October, so just a little bit before the actual election, Trump said the following regarding Jack Smith. Uh, it's so easy. I would fire him within two seconds. However, this is where things you can say get a little bit dicey. Because Jack Smith wasn't a presidential appointee, President Trump would not be able to just unilaterally fire him. However, Trump could order his Justice Department to remove Jack Smith. Doing so would immediately relieve Trump of two cases, of two major cases that have been lobbied against him, the classified documents case, as well as the January 6th case. Both cases have actually been in a bit of a legal limbo for different reasons, but dismissing Jack Smith could do away with them altogether. However, and this was something that was actually raised in that interview with radio host Hugh Hewitt, if Trump were to fire Jack Smith, even circuitously, Congress might actually impeach him over it. Now, of course, the election resulted in both chambers of Congress now being controlled by Republicans, so there is a very low chance of that happening. But even before the election, Trump responded to that concern by simply saying the following. No, I don't think they'll impeach me if I fire Jack Smith. It is worth mentioning, however, that some of the other cases against Trump, such as the ones in New York as well as the one in Georgia, are state and local level cases that Trump would not be able to do anything about as sitting president. However, it should also be noted that those cases will now have to be put on a long hold until at least January of 2029, when Trump leaves office. And so that is all on the prosecution side. Then, moving back to day one, lastly, is the question of the administrative state. While on the campaign trail, specifically in March of 2023, Trump released a video 
detailing his plans to, quote, this is what it said in the video, dismantle the deep state. In that video, he outlined 10 of the concrete steps that his administration would take to accomplish that particular goal. You can see those 10 bullet points right there on your screen. And in regards to our discussion today, point number one on that list, it might actually be accomplished on day one. That first point reads as follows, quote, immediately reissue my 2020 executive order restoring the president's authority to remove rogue bureaucrats, otherwise known as Schedule F. And this is how Schedule F would work in practice. Within the government, there are hundreds of political appointees who come into office with a given administration, and then they leave office when the next administration takes power. However, besides these hundreds of political appointees, there are also tens of thousands of what are known as career bureaucrats who work in the government regardless of administration. They stay in office regardless of whether there is a Democrat or Republican in the White House. In theory, these tens of thousands of people are considered apolitical employees who have the technical know-how as well as the expertise to do their specific jobs and keep the government rolling from one administration to the next. However, Schedule F, they would give the president the ability to convert some of these career bureaucrats into political appointments, making them easier to fire and have a turnover with a new administration. Essentially, it would strip job protections from many of these federal workers and create a new class of political employees. According to one analysis, this one change could affect roughly 50,000 federal employees. And also, along that same line, President Trump recently put out a statement announcing that both Elon Musk, as well as Mr. Vivek Ramaswamy, they will be leading something called the Department of Government Efficiency. This new department, it will not be a new federal agency, but instead it will actually sit outside of the federal government and it will be giving advice and guidance to the White House on how to run a more efficient ship and to have structural reform throughout the whole system. And so there you have it. These are the eight executive actions that President Trump will likely take on day one of his new administration, at least according to the statements that we were able to compile from the campaign trail. If you think that we missed anything, well, please leave it in the comments section below. I'm sure people will appreciate it. And also, over at the Epic Times, we created a very cool tool. It's an online tool that tracks all of the cabinet appointments for Trump's second term. As soon as another name gets dropped and announced, it's added to the graphic, and then below that, a synopsis is given about that particular person. If you want to check it out, I'll throw a link to that tracking tool. It'll be down in the description box below, which is, of course, that description box right below those like and subscribe buttons, both of which I hope you take a super quick moment to smash so that this video can reach ever more people via the YouTube algorithm. And then until next time, I'm your host, Roman from the Epic Times. Stay informed. Most importantly, stay free.